Good afternoon. Sorry for the delay. We appreciate your patience. On behalf of Campus Events and Asian Coalition, I'd like to welcome you here today to Asian Pacific American Women in the Mass Media. Campus Events would like to thank everyone for their um, responsiveness in attending all of our film speakers and concerts this quarter. I'd like to remind you that next Thursday in Royce Hall at 8 p.m. we'll be showing the new Dudley Moore, Mary Tyler Moore movie, Six Weeks. Tickets will be available at Central Ticket Office at James E. West Center. We appreciate your attendance on that. Now I'd like to introduce Kathy Shintaku, who will tell you about today's special guests. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you very much for coming. First, I'd like to also start off by thanking all of our wonderful guests for um, coming to our wonderful program. I'd like to recognize them first. On my far right is Dr. Judy Chu. <laughs> Next to Dr. Chu is Trisha Toyota. And next to Trisha is Beulah Kuo. I'd like to explain what Asian Coalition is. Asian Coalition is a coalition of Asian Pacific organizations. This coalition is comprised of 11 member organizations ranging from cultural groups to social, political, and academic organizations. We have a staff of six administrators and a board of representatives from each member group, which includes Asian American Christian Fellowship, Asian Education Project, Asian Pacific American Law Students Association, Chinese Christian Fellowship, Chinese Student Association, Concerned Asian Pacific Students for Action, Korean Student Association, Lambda Phi Epsilon, Samahang Filipino, Vietnamese Refugee Aid Committee, and the Vietnamese Student Association. I'd like to introduce our first guest speaker, who is right here on my right, Beulah Kuo. She's appeared in such motion pictures as Flower Drum Song, MacArthur, The Sand Pebbles, and the Oscar-winning Chinatown. More recently, she portrayed the Empress of Kublai Khan in NBC's production of Marco Polo. She also produced James Wong Ho, The Man and His Movies. And for that documentary, she became the first Asian Pacific American woman to receive an Emmy. Presently, Ms. Kuo is Vice President of United Way's Region 5 Board of Directors and Vice President of the Association of Asian American Pacific Artists, and also is active in the community. So I'd like to introduce Ms. Beulah Kuo. Thank you. Can you hear? I'm very pleased to be invited today to uh, speak with you students because it gives me a chance to visit with my good friend Trisha Toyota and Sumiha Ru, who is not here or may be here a little later. But uh, I'm glad you students are still kind of practicing the uh, traditional adage of age before beauty and, bra and brains here. But I'm very pleased to come because uh, uh, one student generation ago, four years ago, uh, I appeared here to a student group of Asian American students along with uh, Sumi and uh, Trisha. And uh, at this time, I, I do want to say and laud both uh, Trisha and Sumi for the generosity of their time that I know that they give to so many youth groups. Uh, throughout the city. And I think it's because uh, of these two veteran women in the media that we have so many more Asian Pacific American men and women in the media today. 
Four years ago, uh, when I was here, I was delighted that a number of students expressed an interest in the media, and several of the students communicated with me for quite a long time. In a recent issue of the Jade Magazine, which is published here in town, I was also very pleased to see that there are so many young women, especially, and some young men who are in the newscasting business. In almost every major city here in California, and I think you'll be surprised at this, this uh, statistics, that there is an Asian American newscaster in almost every major uh, city here in California and in major cities throughout the whole country. Uh, and I think uh, that certainly we have made some inroads into this aspect of the media in the past decade. In 1969, when I uh, moderated probably one of the first public affairs shows devoted to the Asian American community, there were very few newscasters, public affairs uh, moderators and producers among the Asian American population. But today uh, there are not only people before the camera, but there are news editors who work behind the cameras, there are more cameramen, there are more editors, film editors, and there's a growing number of uh, people interested in the uh, various aspects of media. And I'm very, I'm very pleased to see that. Then I would like to devote the rest of my remarks uh, to the field in which I've spent the longest. I spent about five years from 69 to about 74 in producing public affairs shows and in moderating them. And these shows came about in those days as a result of the affirmative action that most studios had to take, had to take in order to get their licenses. But unfortunately, many of these shows have Gone, uh, disappeared uh, from our networks. And I felt that at that time and even uh, during uh, this decade, uh, there is a place for shows devoted to the ethnic communities. But in the career that I have spent most of the time, 28 years, I would like to say that the conditions in Hollywood for me as an actress still exist in the following order. The opportunities for Asian American women actresses, especially in the character field, like myself, are still very limited. Number two, too often Hollywood still portray the Asian American men and women stereotypically. Thirdly, rather than having us portray full characters, too often Asian American actors and actors are used to bring only atmosphere and color to the film. And fourthly, Hollywood sadly, too frequently, does not know the difference between a China, Chinese, or a Japan, Japanese. So therefore, too often, they do not use the Asian American woman as an American. And most often, they will use the Asian American actress as a foreign ethnic. Now you might very well ask, well, why do you stay in this profession if it's so limited? And why for 28 years or almost three decades? Well, I was trained as a sociologist and uh, I taught a number of years, but I, early in my career, I believed, uh, like the Chinese adage, that a good picture is worth a thousand words. And in my training as a sociologist, I dealt with influence, mass behavior, and, and uh, uh, how you influence uh, mass action. And I feel definitely that the media uh, provides a great influence on mass uh, perception. 
And for some of these reasons, I have stayed and struggled in this field of entertainment. It was the year of 1954 when Henry King, the great director who's just passed on about three years ago, uh, was producing Love is a Many Splendored Thing. And they were looking for someone to work with Jennifer Jones, who at that time was portraying Dr. Han Su Yin, the Eurasian doctor who wrote the book and uh, who was uh, born in China but uh, had spent many years in Hong Kong. So someone asked if I would go to the studio and be considered as a tutor for Jennifer Jones uh, because they wanted her to learn some of the Chinese mannerisms of a Chinese woman and they wanted her to adapt a, a Chinese accent and um, a Chinese English accent. So I was asked to meet Henry King and he talked to me at length and he said, you're just fine except that uh, you do have somewhat of a Chinese accent, but you have a California Chinese accent <laughs> and not a British English Chinese accent. And so therefore I didn't get the job. But however, he said, I would like you to consider playing Jennifer Jones's auntie in my picture. And would you consider doing that? And I said, sure. Uh, and I was hooked from that time on. And subsequently I took training in different workshops throughout town on acting and so forth. But once you get grease paint on your face, uh, you just can't get rid of it. So I've uh, followed this career for the last three decades. And uh, uh, about 18, 20 years ago, a number of our, uh, us actors were already dissatisfied with some of the roles that we were playing. So we helped to organize the East-West Players, which today is still a very viable theater group. After 18 years of struggling, they finally were able to put a down payment on a small building and ca to call that their own home. But this is the only theater group in the nation uh, that gave the Asian American playwright a chance to be produced. And this is what we're still doing today. Uh, each year we produce about four or five original Asian American uh, uh, plays. Then also I've been very active in a group called APA, the Association of Asian Pacific American Artists. And uh, this group is a, uh, partially an advocacy group. Uh, we strive for equal opportunities for the Asian American performer before and uh, behind this uh, 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 screen as well as uh, before the cameras. And we try to educate not only the industry but our own communities on the harmfulness of stereotypic images, what they are and what we can do about them. And then we also fight against discriminatory actions that uh, frequently appear in the industry. For instance, right now we're involved in some uh, negotiations with the industry on a show where they're using uh, white stuntmen and they paint them down to uh, look like Asian stuntmen. There are adequately trained Asian stuntmen and we feel that they should be given a first chance at these jobs. Now what can we do about some of these conditions in Hollywood? I would like to suggest a number of things. First of all, I think we have to create opportunities for ourselves. And I'm just delighted to see young people like uh, Wayne Wong and um, uh, Johnny Yuan who are young filmmakers and they uh, have gotten together some money, in fact, uh, Wayne uh, uh, produced a picture many of you have seen called Chan is Missing on a shoestring budget of $20,000, which is just uh, peanuts, you know. But the fact that he can do it is most admirable. And uh, the picture is making a dent all over the country. I was in Hawaii just uh, two weeks ago to film an episode of uh, Magnum P.I., and it was being shown there in the International Film Festival. And Wayne himself was there. But uh, we have to create opportunities for ourselves. 
And secondly, I would say thank you. I see I've got five more minutes. I will finish in three, hope. And uh, I, I think we have to encourage more Asian American writers. And I'm also delighted to see that many young people are going into this field. And I would encourage your parents to encourage you to uh, go into the field of the arts, because I think there's a great need there. And there's a possibility of great contribution as well, because so many of our Asians stay with the, um, uh, the doctors and the, uh, uh, the science fields. Then thirdly, I think there should be more networking among the Asian Pacific people. There is an insidious type of uh, discrimination in the industry in the last uh, decade and a half, where they will use only uh, Vietnamese actors and actresses for Vietnamese roles, or only Japanese for Japanese roles. Well, they don't go to look for only an Irish to play an Irish role. Why should they do that to us? And APA has spent a lot of time trying to educate the, um, uh, the industry on this. And I think that uh, uh, you can help. And as students, I think you can be very effective and very influential if you will write letters. The studios are very sensitive to letters from the community. When we write them, they think we're uh, looking for a job. But when you write them, you are, you are expressing your opinion as part of an Asian American community. Write letters if you like a portrayal, and write positive letters if that's so. Compliment them on that. But if they're negative uh, uh, portrayals, offensive portrayals, say so. And I think that the more letters Hollywood receives, they will be more sensitive to your desires and our needs. Thank you. Thank you, Beulah Kuo. I'd like to introduce our second guest, who is Trisha Toyota. Trisha Toyota is the co-anchor of KNBC's News for LA at 5 and 11 with John Schubeck. She joined KNBC in 72 as a general news reporter and later anchored the 5.30 p.m. and 11 p.m. newscasts on Saturday. She began her career at CBS KNX Radio in Hollywood as an action reporter and later as producer, writer, and on-air reporter. Ms. Toyota produced and also reported a weekly feature on the 5 p.m. edition of News Center 4 entitled Four for Your Money, which became a local Emmy nominee for anchoring. So I'd like to introduce our next guest, Trisha Toyota. Um, if you don't mind, I'm going to sit down here. I'm just getting over the flu, so also if my voice gives out, you'll understand why. It's not because of shouting at Schubeck at 5 and 11. <clears throat> um, all the things that Beulah said I think are, are very cogent and very important today, especially now when uh, the mood of the country, uh, the mood of a lot of people's thinking is much different than it was 10 years ago. Uh, when I and a lot of the other minorities were able to get into the media, into television news, of course, in my particular case. Um, a lot of us were hired at the end of the 1960s, the early 70s. As was indicated, I was hired in 72 uh, at Channel 4, but actually began my media career in uh, 70, such as it was, uh, at KNX. Uh, the impetus of the country was much different. You know, we were coming off of the Civil Rights Movement. There was a, a whole big push not only by minority groups, but by liberal white groups who gave us that impetus to help us and to support us get into all kinds of careers, all kinds of professions, which had been previously closed to people of colored uh, background in this country. Ten years later, uh, 1982, 1983, things are a whole lot different. Uh, and even being here on campus, uh, I think that uh, you who are students recognize this fact, even if you're just talking about student cutbacks even if you're talking about the fact that they're going to institute tuition, although I don't know what they call this $400 a term now anyway. Um, you know, there are a whole lot of things that are much different now than 10 years ago. And as students, as minorities who, if you're not thinking about getting into the media, but just thinking about getting into the job market, you have to start thinking about. Um, creating opportunities is very, very good. And uh, Beulah is a perfect example of that. Uh, 
Uh, but what you also have to do is uh, you have to make your position understood when you go out and look for a job. You have to make your worth known to your employer, your prospective employer. Um, in terms of my own experience, uh, I was hired, uh, obviously because I was a minority, uh, 10 years ago, and uh, KNBC made it very clear to me when they hired me that that was the reason. Uh, when I was working, and I tell this story all the time, when I was working at KNX Radio, I was on the air only three times a week uh, for about two minutes. I mean, this was not a big job. Um, and uh, somebody just heard me one day from KNBC and called and said, uh, is your real name Toyota? Are you Japanese? Uh, what do you look like? Um, <laughs> If it wasn't television, of course, they would not have been concerned about what I look like. So three weeks to the day after that phone call, I had quit my job and gone over to work at a television station with virtually no experience whatsoever. Um, there were a lot of obstacles, I think, to begin with that perhaps later I can go into a little bit more uh, in terms of my not only being a minority but being a female and being very young at the time, just basically a couple of years out of uh, grad school. Um, I brought with me today an article that had just appeared in this week's, well, let's see, no, it was last week's Time magazine uh, called Double, Double Jeopardy in the Newsroom. Uh, the subtitle on it is Despite Progress, Minority Journalists Face Stubborn Obstacles Still. And um, I'm kind of glad that this appeared in a, at least a national news magazine like Time because it was a study that was done by uh, Associated Press and by some of the other minority journalists in the country and has just been published. But they polled several hundred minority journalists within newsrooms of newspapers across the country to ask these people, you know, what did they think about their jobs? A lot of these people had now been in the media for maybe five to ten years like myself. Um, and some of the results I think are really uh, interesting. 92% uh, of all of the respondents, of all of the minorities, and 100% of, of all of the black respondents believe that race played a role in their being hired. 75% of those surveyed felt that they did not have the same chances, and this is 1982, did not have the same chances for promotion as white colleagues. 51% said their editors, quote, believe that minority journalists as a group are less skilled than whites. And 10% said that they had been told openly that race was the reason that they were refused certain assignments, notably on sensitive subjects such as school integration. Summed up one unnamed respondent, quoted in the survey, I believe that white editors expect less from minority staffers, and only if we do more will be, we be seen as equal. Now, a lot of that, uh, I think, applies to television news. You have to understand this survey was newspapers only. Uh, a lot of it applies to television news, some of it doesn't. Um, I have never been refused an assignment, at least not knowingly, because of my race. Uh, I think uh, sometimes I was asked not to do a certain subject because I was female. Uh, and I remember a certain instance when I was first in the newsroom that uh, there were a lot of uh, brush fires in Los Angeles, you know, the twice yearly burn down of the LA area. And all of the reporters were out on a story except for myself, and I was the only one sitting in the newsroom when one of the editors came in and uh, looked around the room, saw only me, screamed, I need a reporter, and ran out of the room. Uh, and of course, that was my job. Now, uh, I went out there and said, you know, if I'm a reporter, I ought to be able to cover this story just as well as anyone else. Now, I don't really know whether that was a function of my inexperience, whether that was a function of my, my being female. I doubt if it was being a minority, per se. Um, Television news does not have the luxury of a newspaper in that newspapers, especially, for example, the LA Times, have hundreds of reporters. Uh, you know, we're a very large news station in terms of TV. Channel 4 has, I'd say, you know, two or three dozen reporters. Uh, but we're still a local television station. We're certainly not talking about NBC Network, although we have their facilities. We do not use their staff. Um, but we don't have the luxury of saying, you can't cover this or you can't cover that. If you're going to go into television news, you had better be prepared to cover just about anything uh, that you're capable of doing. Um, the one thing about television is because it's such a visual medium that if you screw up, uh, it's really tough to get a second or third chance. Um, by the same token, you're basically only as good as your last story. 
in newspapers you have a little bit easier time uh, in some ways of spending more time on a story, spending weeks, and sometimes I know one reporter down at the LA Times has spent months researching one story. Uh, we don't have that luxury. You know, we have that four, now we have four o'clock news. Four o'clock, five o'clock, six o'clock, eleven o'clock deadline every single day, day in and day out. Um, we don't have time to think about what we're going to write. You know, what can you say in 90 seconds? Uh, a lot of us uh, are asked whether or not we editorialize, whether we slant the news, whether we do all those other kinds of things. And my answer is, you know, if you really understood the news process, if you really understood what went on in the field, in the editing process, in the writing, the producing, once you get back to the studio, you're damn lucky to get that thing on at all, uh, let alone worrying about editorializing or selecting pictures that you think will slant the story. I mean, it's just one big, huge process that goes on every single day, and there just isn't any time to do all those other kinds of things. Uh, I don't think you're going to get hired nowadays if you're a minority, simply because you're a minority. Um, I think it is true that in many, many cases you're going to have to prove yourself much better than other applicants for the job. And there's no question that everybody thinks that TV news is this big glamorous thing. Um, maybe my job appears to be glamorous, maybe it isn't. Once you get there it's a whole other thing. Uh, there are a lot of television jobs behind the camera that are not being filled by minorities, uh, among other things, because they do not apply. One of the reasons, and Beulah mentioned this Jade Magazine article, uh, one of the reasons is that there are so many Asian Pacific Americans on television in front of the tube across the country is because television is a very imitative kind of an institution. You know, if something works out well, then they'll go with it. And and it's not just minority journalists, or it's not just uh, you know minority reporters. We're talking, uh, you know, the TNA shows, uh, the uh, you know uh, miniseries, the mul the maxi series, whatever those things are. Uh, you know, if something sells, and television, of course, is a money-making business. You know, we're not talking public uh, institutions here. We're talking privately held corporations who are out to make money. Uh, and you have to understand that in dealing with any television or any motion picture uh, industry uh, people. Um, so if they figure that maybe one minority journalist worked, then maybe another one will work uh, just as well or just as equally as well. And when I was working at KNX, I was the very first um, Asian, let's put it this way, Asian minority that they had hired over there. And the news director was so pleased that, that I had worked out so well that when I quit, he hired another Asian woman. When she quit, he hired another one. When she quit, he hired a black uh, when, she, when she quit, and these are all women, by the way, uh, he hired another Asian woman. And that particular position at KNX, uh, at least amongst the five or six of us who've had that in the last ten years, is now known as you know, the, the ghetto position over there. Um, uh, because we worked out so well, I guess. I don't know. I mean, if he hadn't tried me, I don't know what would have happened. Uh, I don't know uh, whether opportunities are getting any better. I think if you have to be qualified, there's no question about that, uh, particularly if you want to work in Los Angeles. You know, where the, uh, I don't care what they say in New York. We are the, the most important market in the country. We're the largest market. We're the most diverse market. Uh, trends, currents, political thoughts, whatever. You know, start out here on the West Coast much, much sooner are much more important national trends uh, than, than many or any you see on the West, uh, East Coast. Um, if you're going to go into television news, be prepared to work in Fresno. Be prepared to work in Bakersfield, like some friends of mine are doing and can't stand it. Uh, be prepared to move out of state, to go to Boise, uh, to go to you know, Pocatello, Idaho. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, in those markets, you get to do a whole lot of other things than you would in Los Angeles. Los Angeles is a very large market. We are all members of unions. Uh, you must be a union member to work in L.A., uh, you cannot do other union jobs. It's a very finite kind of a job description. Um, I think that uh, if you're good and if you stick at it and if you're willing to work for, you know, I mean, I started out 98 bucks a week. Um, Ten years ago, that was okay. I could pay my rent in West L.A., but, you know, so maybe you get $120 a week now. Um, television news, despite what you read about a lot of salaries, uh, a lot of, you know, these, quote, again, the glamour positions, is not necessarily a high-paying job. Uh, most of the people behind the camera and reporters, uh, you know, make good salaries, but by no means are making uh, millions and millions of dollars a year. None of us really is. Um, 
if you're a reporter, your longevity in a career is fairly long. You know, you can rattle around from city to city in, in the United States and, you know, get along okay. If you're an anchor person, it's a much, much shorter span of, you know, employment, uh, maybe 18 months, two years, and that's why you see faces coming and going all the time. Uh, the fact that I've lasted through six news directors is, I guess, uh, indicative of something. I'm not sure what. And uh, have been at Channel 4 for 10 years. I don't know. It's an extremely fascinating job, very fast-moving, fast-paced, high-energy uh, kind of thing. You know, you really have to be an A-type personality in order to compete, in order to do, uh, and in order to be successful. Um, those are the kinds of qualifications that you need. You know, uh, if you're a minority, those will help you even better. Anyway, I'll answer some questions when we get finished here. Before I introduce our final guest for the afternoon, I'd like to invite everyone who's standing on the slides to kind of find a seat somewhere and sit down, you know, and enjoy the program. So why don't you guys just kind of find a little seat. Okay. Our final guest for this afternoon will be Dr. Judy Chu. She received a doctorate in clinical psychology in 79 and is currently teaching Asian American studies classes here at UCLA. And is, this quarter is teaching a course on Asian women. She has been a long-time activist in the community, as last summer she co-chaired the first West Coast Chinese American Women's Conference and at present is co-chair of Minority Women's Task Force and a board member of the Asian Pacific Women's Network. So I'd like to introduce Dr. Judy Chu. Well, as you can see, we each have our individual styles here. <laughs> so I'll speak here from the podium. I'm more than honored to be on this panel of uh, such distinguished guests. But more than anything, I marvel at the fact that nowadays we have role models like this who can be visible, who can be outspoken, and this was not always the case. Let me give you an example of the way things were, and hopefully uh, we can move on from there. But let me give you an example of, of the way things were. A few years ago, a white woman who was writing a series of plays on the entire spectrum of women asked me, what Asian Pacific American women heroines are there? What women are there that I can portray as positive models in the Asian American community? Models of change. I have to admit, I thought about it, and I thought about it, but I had trouble coming up with a name. There are famous Asian women in our history, but are they heroines? I once wrote an article, as a matter of fact, on Anna Mae Wong, an Asian American movie star in the 20s and 30s. But I had to admit and in fact, that's how I portrayed her, that she was a tragic example of what can happen if you are constantly portraying stereotypes of maids and prostitutes. There is another famous name, Tokyo Rose, but what is she famous for? She was accused of treason after World War II and had the most expensive treason trial that took place in San Francisco. It was a striking revelation to me. What role models do Asian American women have? Who teaches us? how to act or what to aspire to beyond the stereotyped images of the media? What persons gives us direction and inspiration? There are some, if you look. I looked back in time. I looked pretty hard, but I found them. There are women like Mitsui Endo, who was one of the three persons to file a major suit against the legality of the concentration camps. There was Hanako Tsuchikawa, who was a leader of the opposition and was sent to Tule Lake during the concentration camp period. In 1909, there was Chan, Le Chan Kum, the wife of a U.S. citizen who was falsely arrested as a prostitute and um, who filed a grievance against it. She was deported, but the important thing was she stood up against that kind of treatment. I could even look around me and see examples of women who were role models in their own ways. Dr. Carol Fujita, a pharmacist who had the courage to file a suit against discrimination on the job against the L.A. County USC Medical Center. There was Esther Lau, who protested uh, sexual abuse by a police officer, 
and went through a trial process. Her case was an inspiration to other Asian American women who decided to get into the law. Masano Siu, an organizer in her food packing company who decided to unionize and got women to get beyond their own individual consciousness to try to see that they can take collective action to improve their conditions. I could even look closer to me to people who were not promoted in the media, people not appreciated in our textbooks. I could finally begin to appreciate my mother who crossed an ocean not knowing the language, leaving her family behind forever, who worked for decades first in a garment factory and then a cannery, who in her own stubborn and strong way fiercely instilled a foundation for her children to appreciate the Asian way but also to succeed in America. But it took me 20 years before I could see this. Why? Because of the stereotypical non-images that were before me. Given the stereotypes that are offered to us by ma the mainstream media and literature, our strengths are often defined for us. We don't appreciate the people around us. We are prevented from seeing our own strengths. And it's not surprising. We have an image that is built by a media that is predominantly controlled by rich white males. As Asian women, we have multiple sources of discrimination, that is discrimination by race, sex, and class, meaning that we have a longer and harder battle to fight to gain access to the powers that influence our thinking. Instead, those that are influenced our, our thinking are choosing our models for us. If you look at the, uh, this week's copy of Newsweek, you'll find that the, there is a quote there from Connie Chung. <laughs> I hear some reaction. Well, whatever your private opinion of Connie Chung, what this article was trying to do was to talk about successful Asian Americans, and it was choosing our successful Asian Americans for us. Whatever you think of Connie Chung, um, good or bad, one thing I think is clear, and that is that she does not represent or feel herself to represent the Asian American community. Why not choose somebody like Trisha Toyota, who actually does represent the Asian American community? There's something going on there. And I think that that's why we have to know what is the difference between myth and reality, why we have to know what is the true picture of things. Let me talk a little bit about that as, as regards to Asian women. First, I'm sure you heard all, of all the myths of Asian women. I'm a, I'm a, I teach psychology classes, and uh, once I was talking about intelligence testing in one of my psychology classes, uh, and one of my non-Asian uh, psychology students was suddenly sparked to ask the question, why is it that in every single one of my classes, the person who gets a top grade in the class is always an Asian woman? I said, every... Every class you have, well, maybe geometry. I suspect there are a couple of things going on here. There's some honest bewilderment, but there's also some exaggeration. And it is true that Asian Pacific American place a lot of values on education. Asian Pacific American educational levels, on the average, are equal to or higher than white women. That's fine and good, but what does this mean in concrete economic terms for our everyday living? where success is often determined by our, our income level. On all measures, instead of average income levels, Asian Pacific American women earn salaries lower than white men, white women, and Asian men. In short, we may have the brain power, but we don't have the bucks to show for it. In fact, contrary to popular belief, few of us are professionals. You who sit here at UCLA, who are working hard toward a profession, or at least making your parents think that you are, are actually a rather select group. The majority of Asian American women are in the clerical field, blue collar workers, domestics, or waitresses. Even those professionals that, are, that we have are very rarely in management level jobs or in jobs of high visibility. So those, all those stories about Asians having made it are just not true. And in fact, we have a whole slew of, of distortions being promoted recently. If you looked at Fortune magazine, it's there. The LA Times had it recently. And Newsweek, just this week, pick up a copy. So what is the point to talking about myth versus reality? What can we do with that information? What I, what I want to leave you with is that the most powerful weapon that you can have is consciousness. 
Consciousness allows you to go beyond stereotypes. Consciousness is the willingness to see things for what they are. Consciousness allows you to see that achieving equality is possible for you. It is so powerful that when the Spanish colonized the Philippines in the, in the 1500s, they erased any documentation on the egalitarian culture preceding it in, in case Filipino women got any ideas about this strange thing called equality. Consciousness can clarify your analysis of what's happening to you and your friends. Without a true picture of the situation, you don't have the proper tools to operate in our society to see it for what it is. Consciousness can give you the motivation and inspiration to work for change, not only for yourself, but for your Asian sisters and brothers and fellow human beings. So what can you do to gain this consciousness? First, rethink the models in your life, especially you Asian women. Think of models that are around you, models that are not determined by the media, pioneers, people who have values to emulate. Secondly, see your own life as a role model, as a potential leader-producing life. You can organize, you can be assertive, you can be visible, you can speak out and fight back. Finally, take collective action. Men, women, whites, Asians, blacks, Chicanos. Individually, you can find ways to deal with inequality, but you can only do so much. Collectively, we can pool our strengths to make long-lasting changes so that our fellow younger brothers and sisters don't have to go through the same thing. It is possible, it is doable, and for our survival, it is necessary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, before I open it up to um, any questions from the audience, I'd like to remind you that we are passing out these little evaluation forms, and we'd really appreciate it if you fill them out and return them at, at the uh, entrance over there. So if anyone has any questions for our um, guests, here? Yes. Uh, 